Right, so the purpose of this video is just to help you out with this assessment and make sure you're on the right track. Um, I'm going to try not to do it for you, but just to point you in the right direction. Um, so let's have a look at the extract. It's from stave one, we're told. And in this extract, Scrooge watches over London from his bedroom as the ghost of his former partner, Jacob Marley, leaves him. He watches as the city seems plagued by spirits and contemplates the evening's events. <clears throat> Have a look at the question. So starting this extract, how does he use the Dickens use the supernatural to create atmosphere? Right, about how Dickens use the supernatural in this extract, how Dickens use the supernatural in the novel as a whole. Right, so that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's all about the supernatural and how it is used by the writer for effects and for meaning. So, let's have a look at the text. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, or, for on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window. Desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, there might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon her doorstep. The misery with them <coughs> all was clearly that they had sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them he could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together and the night became as it had been when he walked home. So we're looking at how does he use the supernatural here to create atmosphere? And that's the interesting thing about these questions. You've got to create atmosphere in this part, but then in this part it doesn't. It just says how does he use the supernatural in the extract? So that that you've got to focus on that. But there could be other ways in which you might want to talk about how he uses it, for example, in terms of context and things and the message for his audience about the way they should treat poorer or less fortunate people and also how he uses the supernatural in the novel as a whole once again you need to keep in mind the idea of atmosphere but this allows you to perhaps say a bit more about things that may not necessarily be solely about the creation of atmosphere now some questions you'll see that this part is actually part of the um, bullet points as well. So you have to be careful that you don't then stray too far from the steer, as they call it, um, which steers you in the right direction. But this one allows, this question allows you a bit more leeway in that respect, which I think will become clearer later. So remember when we did Macbeth, and um, I'll show you. Um, I talked to you about how to do an introduction and I think the same thing applies so put the extract in the context of the whole well it wouldn't be
play would it in this case? Um, it would be. Oops, what have I done wrong here? Um, it would be a uh, novel or novella, more precisely, a short novel. Um, so you'd do that, you'd make reference to the question, make sure that you stick with the question. Explain, try and think about what the point of this particular extract in the context of the question, which in this case is all about the supernatural and atmosphere and why that's important. And then to try and set out a thesis or a theory that the rest of the essay goes on to expand or expand upon or to prove. So when we did it in Macbeth, I showed you this when we did the one about tragedy. That was the kind of model paragraph that I showed you. Now I think some of the things you might want to think about in your opening paragraph is these ideas that from the opening Dickens has established Scrooge as an uncaring miser and you can make quick reference to you can see that through the, his treatment of Bob Cratchit and Fred and the two portly gentlemen if you remember come for charity they come to collect money for charity and refuses but don't go on about it just quickly mention them in one sentence and this extract is the moment where the writer shows us a vision of the afterlife that's waiting for us if we fail to learn compassion for the poor and is the start of Scrooge's journey to redemp redemption. So it's important in that respect. Having established the, the character as this horrible, uncaring person, here is the, the beginning of his chance to learn. But this particular extract shows a sort of vision of the world um, that Scrooge and Marley has, has helped to sort of produce or to um, create. Marley, who's in the extract, obviously is established earlier in the stave as his only fr as Scrooge's only friend, or he doesn't really have friends, but close acquaintances, and somebody who led a, a life much like Scrooge is living right now. And therefore his ghost is important in order to frighten Scrooge into listening to the lessons he is taught by the three ghosts to come. So Marley is an important cousin, an example of what will happen um, to those who won't listen to the lessons that um, Scrooge is taught later on. The atmosphere is deliberately frightening. We've got to remember that's the question. And it's important, the, um, the creation of this atmosphere is important in highlighting how we all create a kind of hell on earth by living selfishly. Now there are, um, in the description to this video, um, two links which you takes you to websites about this theme of the ghosts and how he uses them and the gothic in it, in the novel. So I would read those as well to help before you start just to get you into the idea of what you're doing. So once you've written your introduction, don't make it too long, remember, if you look at this one, um, how long is that? That's uh, 100 words, probably uh, easily enough. Um, you want to try and cut it down, but if you think about some of those ideas, and what you need to be thinking about is what's the point of this particular extract in this particular part of the novel, um, and how does the atmosphere, the creation of atmosphere, what's the point of that? Why is it there? So, and then you look at the extract itself, so you need a three or four points which you want to make about the extract, and this is where um, the, the, the close reading comes in. So you're going to be thinking about um, in word choice, so lexical choices. You're going to be thinking about um, possibly sentence structures. You're going to be possibly thinking about phonological features. Now a phonological feature means any way in which the writer uses sound, the sounds of the words, in order to create techniques. Sentence structures, of course, I should have said, also sentence lengths. Um, and it's always worth thinking about if you see particularly something here. Mm.
sentence lengths um, are a, can be important. If you see particularly short sentences or phrases and clauses, you might want to think about why they're used, or particularly long ones. They're not always relevant, obviously, but they might be. Um, you might want to think about um, figurative language, if there is any. Um, it's not very well written, is it? That is, of course, any use of metaphors, similes, or personification, and, and any literary devices that you think help to create this, the atmosphere. Um, and you have to always have to think about what, how the atmosphere is created, and also why. So, why is it? Why is he using this supernatural um, world? Why is he creating it? What's the point of it? So that everything has to come with a how and a why. So <clears throat> the why, I think, is pretty much the same all the way through. It, it it's it, as we've probably hinted at in the um, introduction. It's in order to create this this sense of horror. Um, um, uh, in order to m help us, the readers, understand and see how awful um, and how hellish the world can be if we don't learn the lessons um, that, that that Scrooge is is going to be taught and has has already be begun to be taught by. Marley, of course, remember that Mar this is Marley's exit, so he's already talked to Scrooge, and Scrooge isn't really taking, doesn't always take him very seriously. Earlier on in the in this in this stave when he's talking to Marley, he just kind of he, he makes jokes and things, and it's kind of he doesn't quite take him seriously. But this is one of those parts where the kind of the reality of what's going to happen to him if he doesn't learn um, seems to um, come crashing down. So the horror of of sort of living selfishly and uh, and the misery that 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 kind of behaviour causes. That's the why really. That's why the writer's doing it all the time. Also, I mean, just purely for kind of entertainment, that um, he wanted to, he wants to write something here that's got a moral to it, that's got a purpose to it, rather like in the spectacles, a very similar thing. But this is a less sort of serious piece of work altogether. There are moments of comedy in it, and there obviously it's a very happy ending and things like this. So he wanted to make it sort of Christmassy, but he also wanted a. Um, uh, it to be more than that, not just a happy fairy tale, but parts of it that are actually quite frightening to get across his message, which is all about the context, of course, which you mustn't forget. So, some things just about the language you might want to think about. Okay, so I'm not going to do it all for you, but some bits and pieces. I think I was thinking about the use of pronouns. Okay, so Marley's ghost and the ghosts and the spirits are all called it. We so we get that. Um, that sound of these things that are kind of um, they're non-human um, and the use of that pronoun all the time creates the horror and the atmosphere um, we get descriptions and if, if you remember when Marley takes this bandage off in order to talk around his Jaw, his jaw collapses. So the idea, almost if you've ever seen a zombie film or anything like that, the idea that he's half, you know, he's that he's half dead and he's half falling apart, 
also creates that horror. And we have Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandits. So the use of sounds are important all the way through this. And you'll interest in here that we've got two monosyllabic words here. Um, and almost um, a kind of certainly we've got alliteration in smart sound but um, you, there's this onomatopoeic feel of the teeth as they clash together in those two words together. Um, you can see the, the use of the verbs here that he ventured to raise his eyes which suggests fear because he's, he's almost frightened to look up um, and the way in which he is confronted by um, this spectre. Um, also the use of spectre itself as opposed to ghost. A spectre is an evil spirit, something frightening and evil or not, well not particularly, well yeah I suppose evil, yeah, um, but certainly frightening. Um, the power that it has, the way in which it can sort of in this part here the window is raised sort of by itself um, uh, as it moves away the power that it has over the world and over Scrooge is all creating this atmosphere of fear and uh, or the, the idea that Scrooge who has always felt himself to be totally in control and powerful is now powerless that he can't do anything and even here it beckons Scrooge to approach, which he did. So that that delayed that um, that clause there. Um, very simple three words shows that he's not in control anymore. Um, and you get the same here when they're within two pieces of each other. Marley's girl's held its hand, warning him to come no near. So there's no words here; he's just being controlled. Um, by the ghost's gestures and you get this very short again short sharp sentence here Scrooge stopped so two again monosyllabic words so it slows the whole thing down to create this sense of tension here so these short sentences creating tension and notice he's not now he's not just being obedient or surprised it's fear that's that's um, that's driving Scrooge's behaviour. And then we get um, lots of um, adjectives and adverbs in this part that all build a sense of horror, fear, like a, a vision of, almost like a vision of hell. So if you look at the words, so incoherent, um, it sounds of lamentation to lament is to like mourn and cry. Um, we've got um, the adverb inexpressibly sorrowful. Um, we've got um, mournful. We've got bleak, dark. Um, all the way through it, loads of adjectives and adverbs that suggest um, a whole semantic field of pain and regret. Notice the self-accusatory, so these these ghosts, uh, just like Marley, are, they blame themselves, they're accusing themselves in with their sorrowful wailings and cryings and of they, they, it's all their own fault. They brought it about themselves through their selfish living. Um, notice that they don't have any. Um, or should I should say before that. Actually, again, we have this lone paragraph here. Um, this short paragraph with short phrases. Again, I think to suggest Scrooge fearful and um, approaching the window, um, although he, he wants to see it, he's desperate to see it, he does it almost slowly and you can feel that because we have three clauses, and uh, one, two, three here, Scrooge followed to the window.
desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. So again, rather like this sentence here, we get these three short clauses suggesting him full of tension and wanting to look but also not wanting to look at the same time. I was going on to say that the, the ghosts uh, are wandering hither and thither. They have no purpose in restless haste. So they're restless, they're going all over the place, they seem to be in a hurry but without any um, purpose. Now, and these are all people who have got these these symbols of um, the capitalist society attached to them. So a safe, of course, where you keep money. Um, and just like Marley's chains, the idea of these symbolic um, shackles and chains, and they're the chains of um, a life devoted to making money. And and they're, so they're just like in life, they seem to be running around in a, a fever of haste and restlessness, but getting nowhere. So it, um, and the, some of them are linked to, together, which that we're told they might be guilty governments. So the idea that uh, a whole government that has neglected the poor. <clears throat> all linked because they're all guilty together um, um, and therefore there's a symbolism in that of a, a kind of a whole system that is wrong and and um, guilty and again it's important that Scrooge knows these some of these people. He's familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat, white waistcoat <coughs> with a monstrous iron safe attached to his ankle. So, again, look at the adjective monstrous. Um, anyway, um, and again the adverb, he cr this ghost cries piteously. And the reason is because he can't assist. So he sees a wretched woman. Now, wretched isn't insulting the woman. It's saying if some somebody is wretched, then they are kind of pathetic and pitiable. Um, and she is with a child, but um, who it saw below upon a doorstep. So he's now as a ghost. He now can't do anything. It's too late. He should have done it in life, and that's an important lesson for Scrooge. The misery with them was uh, all was clearly that they sought to interfere, they, they they were seeking to interfere, to do some good, for good, in human matters, and had lost the power forever. So it's too late for them, because they're ghosts, so they can't do anything about the things they should have done when they were younger, when they were not younger, when they were alive. So this, this idea of regret is really important. Again, look at the way they're described. They're described as phantoms, um, spectres, the the consistent it all the way through, and then um, creatures. Yeah, very, you know, all the words to describe a m sort of monstrous, non-human um, beings. So there's plenty in the extract to get you going. Remember, you you're constantly linking things to context and in this case it's fairly straightforward it's all about poverty and the poor laws and um, you know the, the workhouses and all the stuff that you know you've already covered in when we're looking at this so then novel as a whole you, you, ch you need to choose some extracts you know that you, you might want to use probably two now obviously this is all about fear and 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 um, a very kind of gothic, frightening atmosphere. So, how might you use atmospheres in other places, you know, in other parts, and the supernatural? Well, you might want to pit, pick a more, you know, contrasting um, passage. So, for example, in stage three, which is the, we're looking at this part, is the ghost of um, Christmas present. Um, 
this is uh, you know very different because it creates this idea of this cheery festive atmosphere with uh, Christmas decorations and all this kind of thing so and and you get just plenty of stuff in here you could look at at the the the, the use of language and the lists and the the idea to, to and the use of light and everything to create a real kind of you know typical Dickensian Christmas um, that really made made way for the way in which we the Victorian Christmas you know the way in which we celebrate Christmas now with all the the idea of this cornucopia of of delight and this idea of um, the idea of plenty and abundance and so the atmosphere created here is very different for very different reasons and you might want to look at that and think about why the atmosphere is so joyous here and what the, the point of this part of the of the, um, the novel is so you can choose other parts and then of course later on in the same uh, thing at the end in the same state at the end we have he opens his cloak and then you see these figures of these children of um, want and ignorance and that creates a very different atmosphere um, further down And when we then look at the description there on this page of the boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, um, all these things in a very different atmosphere created. And I'm going to let you think about why, but I think it's pretty obvious what's what's happening there. Um, um, and so, you know, that's the kind of thing you need to do. So you might want to look at that. You don't have to this stave I mean I would, and then as long as you're showing you understand that the use of the supernatural is linked with um, Dickens's purpose which is to to show his audience how living in this sort of selfish grasping way is wrong and um, they need to change their ways if that's the way they are living. So um, best of luck with it all. And um, as I say, there's two um, articles which are well worth reading before you start, um, which touch on a lot of these ideas that I've put in the description below. Okay, bye then.